trained in the fundamentals of acting, in movement, stage combat, pantomime, improv, is the very handsome man right next to me. Hi, Ken. Thank you Corella. so much. I mean, this is terrific. I, I have to share with the audience that most recently, I was uh, fortunate enough to interview you on the red carpet for Snitches. You are one of the stars. And I look at you, and you're the sweetest man. <laughs> you're kind, you're loyal. But after I saw that movie, Steve Rahman's movie, I was reluctant to come near you. It was intimidating. My character was very dynamic. He was someone that may not be well-liked because he was, he was a vicious character, but he was clever. He was also someone who's very calculating, and he knows what he wanted to do to try to get ahead. Now, he was driven. I have to ask you this question. How driven are you? I believe in resiliency. I believe in going after your opportunities and creating them when they're not there. Okay. I have to talk with you about auditions. You know, I've been called in as a SAG actress and after, and I'm getting called in just five lines and under. <laughs> However, some of the shows that you've been in, the Deborah Messing show, right, things like that. And I have to ask you about the auditions because that's got to be so intimidating to so many people. It is, it is. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about that, some advice you give. Sure. The audition process is something that you have to learn just to go in and to do the best you can with what you understand your role to be. And if they like your look, if they have a good feel for who you are as an actor, they'll let you know and hopefully you'll get a call back or even land the role. But I think we put a lot of personal um, priority to what it is and sometimes you come away guessing, well, I wasn't this and right, I wasn't right. that. And they all said the same thing, you were terrific. It may, <laughs> not, it may not come down to about you, it may be simply Maybe they needed some red hair or blonde right. hair, or maybe you were too right. tall or not tall enough, or maybe you look too much like a different character already cast on the show. So there's a lot of things that could happen, and you have to learn not to read into it. Just go out, be yourself, own your audition, and go in there with a lot of confidence. Go in there and build your own momentum. I appreciate you saying that. In fact, I think I should write a book after all the interviews I'm doing. Artie Pasquale? you know, from sure, sure. HBO, The Sopranos, and Take It Back. He said, usually after the 17th or 18th, you audition, you should try to get something. Well, there is, there is no exact... No exact number. There is no exact number, and, and this acting world is completely different than being a carpenter. Yeah, so we're going to be talking. We're continuing with your audition. Right, and, and, and the finish line keeps moving, so you're, you're working towards a goal, 
like a marathon, but a marathon has a finishing point. You know if you start here, you end there. The acting, you're always reinventing yourself, you're always learning, you're always meeting new people, and maybe you're learning from the last audition that you went out on, and maybe you did a really nice job and you just weren't the right fit for the character for a number of reasons, and you can't take it personal. Yeah. And we say that, but you come out of it and you say, oh, how did I do? What do you think? Did I get it? I mean, we, we have to be honest and you have to be thinking that too. Well, I look at it, if you're a comic and you make somebody laugh, then you did your and job. You did your job. If you're a hard-nosed character and you made somebody cringe, then you did your job. So it doesn't really matter what, whether you got the role or not. At least you gave someone a thought. Are you worried about being stereotyped or typecast? Um, absolutely not, because Good. I think typecasting is actually a good, good thing. Thank you. I, I mean, not so too many good. actors are so versatile where they could just transform themselves, maybe they, their appearance. Right. But right. If, if you're on a TV show and you're playing a detective, mm -hmm. now they want you to play that same character in a movie, well, they don't have to train you. You just walk into that role. I wanted the audience to get to see this clean cut, <laughs> sweetheart, because now I want to show the trailer oh, no. to Snitches. Beware. <laughs> Beware. <laughs> This town is full of scumbags, wannabes, dictators, wise guys, and snitches. I'm done with this. Don't want no part of it no more. But they keep pulling me back. One last job. In this business, one last job means your time is gone. My name is Vincent Abelli, and I'm a snitch. Listen up, boys. These are the rules. I got a bag of cash waiting for the guy that brings me the snitch. You bring me the snitch, you get the cash. As simple as that. Yeah, so we were talking about the self-conscious nature of, right. of right. Yeah. what it's like to be an actor, an artist, a performer. And in the beginning, we are self-conscious because you're not used to right. what you look like, what you sound like. And this is the only profession where you're actually judged on your appearance. So true. So true. And for somebody, somebody might think you're too tall, you're too pretty, you're not sure. pretty enough, you're too thin, you're too heavy. Because it is such a subjective field Very in subjective. both modeling and also in acting. Did you ever think you did a horrible job in an audition only to land the job? Please share. A ab absolutely. Um, and it's a recent story. Um, there was that new TV show on cable called uh, Making of the Mob. I was actually cast to play Albert Anastasia in the series and my audition was a little weird and it was very small room and I had a moving chair and the guys, the, the, the casting directors in LA on, on, the, on the feed from the, the video and the casting agent in New York is feeding me the lines and she was stepping all over the lines and my oh, chair is moving it's horrible. And, and she had me going from one character to the next and he's giving me directions to that and I thought I botched the whole thing. So I get a call back couple like a week later that we want you to play Albert Anastasia but the problem was I had to turn down the role because I was in the middle of filming snitches 
and the right. two characters did not, you know, just didn't jive. One had a 1920s haircut, and my character for Snitches was scruffy, and there was just no way I could work back and I also forth. love what you said while watching the clip, and we're going to see one of you in a moment. You said that you had actually gained weight, yes. and that you went without sleep for a day and a half, but you have to get into that character, and I wonder if the audience is conversant with that. How much goes into sure. it, what you're putting into it. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, you know, we shot the opening scene, I was fresh, and, and it was, the story was developing and, and unfolding. Right. As my character gets a little bit more in his head, and, 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 and the whole concept of trying to find out who's the snitch, who's out of control, who's trying to move in and take over, I had to try to show that I'm out of control. I'm, I'm looking weathered. I'm looking weary. I'm looking sloppy. And, and, and my personality started changing. Changing. I saw that in the movie. I was watching from the beginning where I said, OK, and then suddenly at the end, you really did intimidate them. Yeah, I, 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 I lost lo it. It was, yes, everything. Exactly. The house of cards that I was trying to create just started just collapsing. Collapsed. All right, let's take a quick look at this particular video, which is a 30 second video which shows you and shows what I'm talking about. You want to snitch on me? I'll snitch you. <laughs> you killed them cops? I did. And where's Johnny? Johnny's dead. What do you mean he's dead? Johnny was like family to me. So was I. He's getting away! Get out of here. You're letting it get away! Lied to me. What are you talking well, about? I lied to you. Surprise most viewers that you didn't start out as an actor. No. I want to give a little bit of your background because sure. it is quite incredible. Oof. You were a firefighter. Yes. And you actually, in 2002, 2003, you'd run into buildings to save different people. You were decorated four times. Yes. You loved this job. It's in you to help people. And then we see what, what's on there on the screen. Yeah. And after a while, with all the surgeries, after, th what was it, 13 years, 11 years? I was a firefighter for 13, 13 years. years. Yeah. You could no longer do that yeah. job. And it hit hard. It did hit very hard. Um, I was a firefighter for 13 years. And I had a couple injuries that wound up you know you know losing I, I lost my career as a result of it and you didn't realize the devastation until you weren't getting any better and you went through the physical the emotional and the financial downturn in life and previously I was able I was very resilient I could bounce back right. okay if I lost a job or if I, I could find something else to do but I lost my primary career as a firefighter I lost a wonderful second job. I was a safety inspector who oversaw oh, safety on construction gosh. sites. Right, and I right. was on the verge of developing a product and getting it onto the market that I invented. So I lost everything. And my life was comfortable. I had no mm. issues. Mm. I had a great relationship with friends and family. And the physical pain just nearly destroyed me. All right, we call this depression. And we were talking about depression. Yes. That there are different types, of course. You know, you know, you have your mild depression, sure. which a lot of people will go through. Then you have your moderate, and then you have a point where it's major and you can no longer function. Yeah. And this is where you can't eat, perhaps. Different things happen where you feel isolated, hopeless. Am I correct? You, you hit the nail right on the head, Gail. It's you know, we all go through our seasonal depression. We go through our temporary situation. We break up with a, with a loved one, or right, maybe right, right. we lose the passing of, a, of, of someone that we care about, maybe our dog or our pet. But that generally goes away. But when you deal with emotions, when you deal with physical, right. the physical pain, that doesn't that go doesn't away. Go. The physical pain bounces off the emotional pain, and the emotional pain bounces back with the physical pain. And so you're playing this vicious game of ping pong that neither side wants to win. And it wears you down over time. And I think that's mm -hmm. the catalyst of one of the reasons why people go into a much deeper depression. Yeah. And once yeah. you start feeding into the negativity, 
you perceive things as being negative. I mean, the opposite yeah. is true. If you perceive things mm -hmm. to be positive, positive, you have a smile, your chin is up, people right. want to surround right. themselves with you. But right. if the they, secret. Yes. The, the whole idea, the premise of yes. the book, the movie, The Secret. There is dysthermia, which a lot of people have too, which is a form of depression, which is that you can still function, yes. but you're never totally happy. Correct. Most doctors, if, if you do look into this, will say that you have to be depressed for at least a period of two weeks. Right. And then, of course, you have bipolar, sure. which is a form of depression. Sure. But I, I, I totally understand you know, what it is you're saying. Uh, I'm a very positive person, as you know, and I'm happy about that. Um, I lost my husband years ago to pancreatic cancer. Sure. He died in my arms. And after the funeral, after all the attention, when everybody left, I was painting a dog house. He had gotten me two dogs as gifts. And one more dog house was to arrive. When the delivery man came, my daughter had gone back to college. I was alone. I wasn't going back to school to teach for another week. I thought that's what I needed to do right. instead of keeping really busy. And the delivery man came. And he said, hello, anybody there? I said, oh, I'm in the back and I'm painting. And what he said put me into a tailspin for a while. And it was so innocent. But what he said to me is, I hope your husband realizes oh, how lucky he is to have you. Right. And I went, and the emotion just the poured out. Yeah. I looked at him and I said, thank you, I'll tell him. When he left, it hit hard. Yeah. Everything closed in on me. I couldn't breathe. So I understand you know, what it is you're talking about. In fact, I even ended up calling a hotline. I was not suicidal at the time, but I wasn't around enough people to know how I was behaving. I lost a lot of weight. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't sure, eat. Sure. And I called the hotline. And it's interesting that you know, when I called up, they said, are you OK? Are you, are you suicidal? I said, no, I just feel like it's dark and I can't breathe. And I just need somebody to talk with. You know, it's not like getting on the computer. Can you relate to that? You know, it's funny. You said it's dark and you can't breathe. Mm -hmm. I guess at the height of my depression, and I was dealing with depression and anxiety, and usually one is accompanied by another sign or symptom. Okay. Um, I was having reoccurring nightmares okay. where I couldn't sleep, and, and if I fell asleep, I would be woken up, you know, sometimes in cold sweats. Sweat, like you and, and, can't and, and I yeah, felt I trapped. I, I felt claustrophobic right, right, that right. I was in a coffin, okay. and somebody yes. was nailing yes, down, yes, and, and I was inside, trapped alive inside I get, there. I get and, that. I would, and this was going on for many, many months, and it was difficult. It was very difficult, and, and you keep playing back in your mind, how did I wind up yeah, here? How did this Why? happen? And you're blaming yourself. You, you start to become the victim. You Thank blame you. yourself, yeah, yeah, and like you so did true. something it's wrong, true. but it's yet, true. you know, you know and, and you're dealing with the agonizing pain from the knee and from the back, and you're dealing with the aftermath of being evicted, having your car repossessed, oh, my goodness. can't pay the bills, right. um, don't have money now to go over the bridge to see your child, to see your son, to see your friends. Then it goes to you don't want to do it. You know, I had to move back in with my mother at, at 40 and something that's years not old. What you to and, and, you know, no. after having a beautiful two bedroom townhouse. Right. And it's like the ride was just a roller coaster that you didn't want to be on. Now, did you go to a doctor to get help? Did you get medication? And that isn't always the solution either. It's not. I, I tried antidepressants, I've been no. on some. Um, you know, uh, anti-anxiety for, for, for panic mm -hmm, attacks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm like, these doctors, what are they doing? You sit and you, and maybe it helps to a degree. And I was going for a year straight to, to a psychiatrist. Right, right. And then someone suggested, said, hey, you know, they're listening, they're giving you medication, but they're not curing the problem. problem. Oh. Someone said, try an acting workshop. There you go. And I said, an acting workshop, yeah. Oh, so I, I enrolled back in school. And I enrolled at Purchase College. It's a performing arts college. And I started taking acting classes. They allowed me to take an acting workshop. And it's once a week, three and a half hours. And you're doing all these exercises. Breathing, too. Breathing. Helps. Breathing Relaxation. Helps. And I'm like, oh, when are we going to get to the reading? They says, and I'm like, you know, thinking you're going to go there and you're going to learn. Long. No. no. It's no. a process to understand yourself within. And that helped me I love that. to I relax. Love that. It helped the yeah. start of 
at least getting my mind well, under control. Right, right. With me, it was talking to somebody at 2 o'clock in the morning, being so alone, and not knowing who to reach out to, sure. and then knowing how to take care of my daughter and going back to school. What I do love, though, about acting, which is very interesting, the breathing and all that scented you and helped you, but when you are an actor, you have to peel away those layers. So you're not hiding behind it. You're learning who you yeah. are, correct? You know, as an actor, you're learning as you're doing this. And this is probably why it takes a while of training to get to that point where you could peel back the layers. You want to be vulnerable as an actor. You want someone to see you defenseless. And right. if you could do right. that, you will make your character much more believable. I have to ask you, are you in baseball? <laughs> you're playing, you're, you've got to close on that, yes. if you wouldn't mind. Uh, baseball, yeah. I mean, you know, my primary <laughs> love in life was to play for the New York Yankees. There you know, you go. I, I sat on Thurman Munson's lap when I was a kid, and you know, I looked up at him one day. I said, "Hey, Thurman, I want to be a catcher just like you." He looked Aww. at me and says, "What's wrong with you, kid?" <laughs> you know, you know, and he's showing me his hands where he's got the, the Aww, you know, the finger that's, that's broken and the knuckle that's jammed. He goes. And he gives me a pat on the back, and he's looking down. I'm looking up at him. It was a gorgeous moment. I was maybe 10 years old, so, you know, ever since then. Well, I want to thank you. I'm going to have you back after this movie Please. comes out. Thank you. And we're going to continue. And you know what? I also want to thank you. I get emotional. Yeah. Because you're so brave to talk about an issue, the depressive state, which many people have gone through. Yeah, you know what it is? Thank you. It, it, it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty rough guy, I'm a tough guy, I'm a nice guy. I'm, I mean, nice I've guy. done a lot of things, and a lot of times we hide it and harbor it inside us, and you can't do it. You have Beautiful. to let it out. You have to let people know what's going on, and be a, don't be afraid to share. You know, you'll realize there's a lot of people that love you and a lot of people that care for you if you just let somebody know you're hurting, because a lot of times we hurt in silence, because they see this tough exterior and, and they think that. there's nothing wrong with you right, and right. they and, and the phone doesn't ring and maybe you would like for it to ring maybe you could use that call from a friend that you haven't heard from or, or a guy is inviting you to lunch and don't be afraid to reach out and once you reach out you'll be you'll you'll realize how much better you feel because now other people will look for you to help you the other thing that helped too is helping in charities when I got involved in charities, and I know you as well, bless you for it, lymphoma, You need chemo. a purpose. You, you need, need a purpose. you got to find a purpose. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And your purpose today was to help us out, understand that, and I want to thank you. You're a doll. Thank you so much, as always. Love to you always. Mm -hmm. Paula Gottlieb Herman with me, and as you can see, she's in her chef's outfit. I want to go into a little bit of your background. Sure. And I'm excited because I don't cook that much, and we're going to cook today with all the guests that were here, yes. which is a, a fabulous thing that you're doing. Now, you were the former mm -hmm. NBC News. Mm -hmm. You were a production coordinator. Correct. And you have worked with so many different celebrities. That's true. Very briefly, I know that you work with Al Roker, mm -hmm. you work with Martha Stewart, yep. uh, Paul Prodham, if I'm yep. saying his yes, name Paul correctly, yes. and you even worked with Ellen DeGeneres. Mm -hmm. to, Can a, to you a degree. share a little bit about what you did? Sure. And then I know in 2002 your yeah. life changed. Big time. Yes. And look who you are today. Yes. So share a little bit. So I began uh, my career at NBC and I loved it, Gail. Oh. It took me two years after college to finally get in there. And eventually it happened, and it was my dream job. I started out as a production coordinator, as you said, on a show called The Sunday Today Show. Then I moved on to The Today Show and to Nightly News and on to Sunrise and Meet the Press. How exciting. And it was amazing. How exciting is it kept building and building, and it was a true privilege. And I was a production coordinator, I was a unit manager, and the best part of all is I had a segment producer opportunity, which I wanted so badly, and I had a producer who said, go for it. And I had, I had the opportunity to produce some wonderful human interest stories, wonderful uh, stories on stuttering and how to be able to have a new technology to help with that. 
uh, Cirque du Soleil when they first came to America. Al Roker and I did a beautiful piece on them. And then the food elements. Um, I loved unusual food. And so I said, hey, Al, what about doing a segment on fugu, blowfish, and right, right. wagyu, hand massage? Japanese right. Yeah, right. he's like, I'm in. I did uh, a Ben Vereen segment. So, you know, it was a very varied amount of uh, human interest stories as well. And it was, you know, 80 hours a week and some of the best times of my life. But you loved it. And it's, you know, it's, it's your passion. You so enjoy it. Yes. Now, in 2002, your, your dad passed away. Right. Sorry. So, and I thank you. It was certainly for me a very, very defining moment in my life. And my dad and my mom, you know, I was an only child. Mm -hmm. And they were my world. And to a great degree, I was their world. And when I was working at NBC um, and working 80 hours a week, I loved it. Clearly, that was true. But my dad's kidneys began to fail at the latter part of my career. And as a result of that, my job was eliminated um, because of a major big shift from GE uh, buying RCA. And those things happen. And it's division-wide. It, it happens. Correct. But I think I was at a point where I could have been reemployed so quickly but my dad's kidneys were failing, and he needed me. Family and first. that was family always first. Family first. So after that had happened, um, two years later, my mom's heart was beginning mm. to fail. Mm. So those two things really changed the scope of the kind of work that I knew I'd be able to do. So my TV days, which was my first love, was put on a back burner. Um, and then I was doing all kinds of other wonderful work, but mostly from home, so I could really kind of help out. Right. In 2002, which was nine months after my, uh, my husband Michael and I got married, mm -hmm. my dad passes. And I was certainly devastated, mm -hmm. but at my dad's funeral, the gentleman who officiated gave me a piece of advice that changed my life. And I can guarantee, as part of what he does, he tells people all the time, do this, do that. But for me, it resonated. And when he said, Paula, the best way you can honor your father's memory is to keep alive traditions that were important to him. Oh, it's beautiful, beautiful And I said, beautiful. oh my God, here in the middle of you know, a funeral home, I it said, is. I'm having an Oprah light bulb yeah, moment. It, it and that's what I said. I said, my dad was a foodie. If I can imbue children with a love and a passion for food, that's my father's legacy. So for the last 10 and a half years, I became Chef Paula to honor my dad. Because every time a child is excited about cooking and trying new foods and being right, more adventurous, right, right, right. that connects me to my father's memory. So that's how little chefs Correct. got started. Correct. OK, and it's so important that children be involved in the cooking process. Absolutely. There's so much they can learn. In addition to eating properly in the nutrition, mm -hmm. there's math, it's going to the supermarket, sure. there's getting involvement, it's family. And Correct. I know you said your three loves are yes. family, family, cooking, yes. and television, Correct. which I know you want to end up doing a show. Correct. And what would be the premise of the show? So the, the premise of the show, which would be called Chef Paula's Cooking with Stars, is meant to have me be able to cook with some celebrities and some non-celebrities, but people who have great recipes. Food is the glue for family. Right. So if I can go into a home or an apartment and learn how these families are keeping their mm. lives together, together, their traditions exactly. together, their holidays. What's right. their secret secret sauce, per se? Sure. And I've been collecting celebrity cookbooks, and with all the celebrities I have worked with over the years, I think it would be an interesting way for me to connect with them. And I only have two recipes that came from my parents. Uh, my mom was old school. She never believed in you know measuring. She Try things, and, and that she, would but be she, the way that she it would work. just had That's great. magical she hands. Had magical, magical hands. hands. Okay. So I love that. So I'm on a mission now to connect with other families and see what they're doing uh, in their kitchen and in their in their legacy, oh, which they're passing along. Now, I know that you had an encounter with Lucille Ball. <laughs> You've got to share that because that's terrific. Oh and God. maybe it could be part of your show. That's true. Uh, I, I was a year prior to NBC. I was, I, I invited myself. I can't even say I was invited. Uh, one of my friends came into, I was working as a, an editor of a tourist magazine. And he came in and said, oh, I'm, I'm going to go see Lucille Ball tomorrow. I'm like, what, what? <laughs> 
come again? One of your heroes. So he said, yeah, I'm going to be you know, shooting some photos at a rap party for a movie called The Stone Pillow. I said, oh, please, I beg of you, let me come. And he said, I could, OK. So I went uh, to Limelight uh, in Manhattan, and I saw her. Here is my idol, oh, just a couple incredible. of feet away. Right, I'm excited. And I went up to her, and I was only a year out of college. And I said, Miss Ball, I had written a short story called Maggie a year ago about a homeless woman, and your movie is about a homeless woman. And that's what woman. her movie was about, right? And I didn't go up to her and, you know, do I, there were no selfies then, you know, no, no selfie course. sticks. No. Um, and I just, you know, talked to her about her movie and and the research that I had done. She says, "Dear, please come have some drinks with me." So Let's she and see. I sat down with with her peep with her peeps. And we sat and we had a wonderful, wonderful time talking. And she asked me before I left, would I send her my manuscript? She wanted to read my version of Maggie and what my homelessness how meant to me. How you, but how incredible that she would do that. So here I am, a year after college, right. I'm in a car service going back to Brooklyn. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm a cloud. This is amazing. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just, it's like, pinch me, you know? But then reality set in, and I said, can I really send her my manuscript? Like, who am I? Who am I? Oh, no. So sadly, she passed a couple of years later, and my opportunity went bye bye. But here is something that I think might definitely make me feel as though okay, I made, so made the camera. pieces connect. <laughs> I want to invite Lucy Arnaz and Desi Arnaz Jr. to cook with me. I have your mom's recipes. I have I Love Lucy cookbooks. Please let us connect together, cook something that your mother loved to make for you guys, and be able to have my Chef Paul's Cooking with Stars happen from that vantage point. Then, at the very end of our segment together, I will then give you the manuscript, Maggie, that was meant for your mom. And I'm coming too. Yes. <laughs> My, 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 I'll make something. I have to ask you, because I know you're involved in so many different charities sure. with children. Yes. Would you mention some of them, please? Well, right now, uh, the biggest charity that I'm involved in is the March of Dimes. And when it deals with premature birth, when it deals with, um, you know, uh, different kinds of illnesses for children, uh, infant mortality, it's a, it resonates with me. I've had multiple miscarriages, so I understand right, what loss right. is like. So I am the logistics chair for an event called the Signature Chefs Auction. The Signature Chefs, Chefs Auction. Auction. And that's on, on October 26th. And we're going to have amazing celebrities and chefs. And we're going to have vendors that are going exciting. to have tastings of amazing food, amazing beverage, wine, spirits. Uh, it's going to be great. And, and that's going to raise money? Exactly. And for all these babies that had a really hard start. Well, we're going to cook in, in a few minutes. Yeah. But please share your website where sure. somebody can reach sure. you. So the company uh, that I've been running for the last 10 and a half years is called lilchefs.com special events. The actual website itself is www.lichefs.com, lilchefs.com. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my and pleasure. I'm going to see you in a few minutes because we're all cooking together. Are we all hungry? Because, guys, we've got a lot can. of good stuff going on. Trust me, we're hungry. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Thank Paula. you so Thank much. Thank you, baby. Mm. Mm. It's so good. <laughs> Chef Paula, this is great. We have everybody here, and we're all assigned different jobs. Correct. What are we making? So this is what I call a no-cooked tomato and mozzarella sauce. The beauty here is we know it's 90 degrees today, but this is wonderful all year long. Let's say you guys are on the road, you guys are doing movies, you guys are doing TV. So we want to come home to a comforting kind of meal, but not have us be chained to the stovetop. So this meal includes terrific pasta. Uh, it's a great example there of what I call penne rigatti has little little ridges on it, and this is meant to hold the sauce really, really well. I love that. So we have penne rigatti. Next up, we have tomatoes. Now, these tomatoes I picked this morning at 11.30 from my friend David's beautiful garden. And these are what we call mini heirloom tomatoes. Sweet, just so delicious. Mm. It really needs nothing to make it taste good. God did that. I mean, they're just naturally wonderful, and even though we're going to be adding in 
olive oil and salt and pepper, basil, uh, a little bit of garlic and parsley, the tomatoes are gonna do the job for us, guys. So if you can boil pasta, you got this nailed. You guys ready? I can, can we do it? Right, can we do, do it? it. All right, let's right. go. Now I'm gonna have you slicing the tomatoes got for it. me with the paring knife. Okay. I would like to have you, my friend, working on garlic duty. So we have a garlic peeler that will enable you to get the skin off. And you know how they have like a little paper coating for the garlic? If you put a garlic clove right inside and then roll it back and forth on, on the actual, Ooh, yeah, like that. exactly, and then roll it back and forth. Who are you scared with that little piece of garlic? <laughs> you can do any size you want, but now it's a little too big. Anything that fits into the hole. So the goal is to be able to roll it back and forth on a surface. Can I try now? Yeah, and then when you hear it crunch, you hear, yeah, oh, you got, you're, you're strong. Okay, I'm gonna have you do some more tomatoes, my friend. Yeah. I okay. love that. And then, yes. hey, wow. let's get you to do some parsley. Now, the parsley and the, the basil have already been washed and spun dry. Please. And we're going to dump everything into our big bowl. Now, guys, I'm going to do the basil. And the basil for me, see, told you. Uh, have you guys ever heard of the word chiffonade? Yes. So the chiffonade in this case is taking some of the largest leaves, maybe, you know, six or seven of them, getting them all put together as a little package, almost like, almost like a little, almost like a little um, cigar. And I'm going to roll them. Is this jalapenos? Nope, those are actually heirloom tomatoes. They're sweet and delish. So guys, I'm going to be making a little, like a little cigar. Okay? Oh, look at that. And then I'm going to take, I'm going to take, oh yeah. Take my knife and make almost like a little confetti. So this is called a chiffonade. And everything is going into the bowl, guys. Everything. And the beauty is this will take about between one and four hours to get really delicious. And the sauce, this is the sauce. So keep going on my tomatoes. How's my okay. parsley coming? Okay. Excellent. I love the colors, the textures. Exactly. Should we do more garlic? Oh, you know what? Half of us are Italian here. Go for more garlic. Go, go, go yeah, for absolutely. it. Go for it. Go for it. It comes out. Yes, and, yes. Oh, that smells so yeah. good. We're also re you know, getting some of the essential Whoops. oils Sorry. are being released. <laughs> We're doing well, guys. Oh, good. See, and the reason I like using a mincer for this is because when garlic is not cooked, it's not sauteed, it doesn't mellow. So I don't want a big piece of garlic kind of hanging no. out in my pasta no. if it's raw. So good job, thank you very much. And the colors, look at that, it's just magnificent. And this is a quick meal exactly, to exactly. make, correct? Exactly. Now the kids can help, not with oh, the cutting. Oh, sure, but you know what, the they kids, can do can, something, right? kids can take our salad spinner mm -hmm. and they can dry some of the herbs for us. Okay. The kids can make, put the olive oil in, they can measure the olive Notice oil. Notice we're going faster and faster, oh, we're so hungry. I know, but look, the smell, guys, I'm sorry you can't <laughs> smell what we can. <laughs> did everybody wash their hands? I did, I just went to the There you go. Love it. How are we doing on parsley? Oh, Peg is oh, doing beautiful. great. Pest, excellent. Uh, okay. And your tomatoes are terrific. Your tomatoes looking good. Whoops. Garlic is, oh, beauty. Nah, that's what I'm talking about. Now, Whoa, that's a flavor. That's a just good so tell you, This man's strong. You're Whoops. good. And what you can do is you can just get that little guy down. Ah, yeah. Nice, nice. I didn't have that oh, that's, tool at that's my disposal. Good. That is so, this is going to make it taste so delicious. Now, Paula, when there are contests, and yeah. you see this on TV, sure. I do have to ask you this. Mm -hmm. They evaluate you on the taste, yeah. texture, what else? Explain to me what's important to a chef. Well, you know what? To me, you certainly want to have good mouthfeel. You want your food to taste good. And when we all learned as children that we eat with our oh, eyes, right. it needs to look good. So visual, good. definitely. I love things with multi textures. Okay. Give me a little bit of you know chew. Give me something that's soft. Okay. I like different kinds of things. I like a little sweet, savory, a little sweet. So for me, I like to balance that. Right. And I'm not a big salt lover, guys. Salt. Oh. There's a there's a place for salt, but I don't use a lot of it because I can compensate by using my herbs, by using my garlic, by using cheese and and pepper. And that way, the level of salt, you know, retention and sure. people who have hypertension, right. and all not that. so necessary. Sure. You can cook sure. effectively, deliciously, without, okay. without gin ginormous amounts of uh, salt. And even here, mm -hmm. I'm using extra virgin olive oil. Okay. And we're talking about a quarter of a cup for an entire pound oh, of look pasta. At that. Go pretty. for it, buddy. Absolutely. Oh, it looks good. Awesome. Oh, oh, oh. Does it smell? Oh. It smells good. Awesome. Perfect. Now let's get now. Let's get some. 
pepper. Now the pepper is about a quarter of a teaspoon, not a huge amount. Let's, let's pop it all in, dump it right in. This is our bowl. Uh, let's get our salt. That's about one teaspoon of salt. Do you want more tomatoes or are you good? Uh, I, I would like a little more to be You'd honest. You'd like a little yeah. more? Yeah. Okay. And give me a pop of color. Right now I'm seeing lots of red. We got lots of yellow. Oh, you now. want some more? Yeah, yellow, a little bit yellow. of yellow. So, so yeah, give me a little, little more yellow, a little more orange. And that way we'll have a beautiful quartet oh, yeah, good, of thank color. You. This is awesome. Come now, guys, the pasta does not have to be penne, but I would recommend a short uh, tubular type pasta. You can use rigatoni or even maybe even a, a short cut uh, farfalle or um, the butterfly or uh, bow tie pasta. You can also do it gluten free. I did that with, with my cousins um, recently and it was fantastic. Mm. Awesome. Okay, garlic done, garlic. tomatoes yes. done, olive oil. Let's, let's get the last little remnant in here. Done. Okay. And it's fun. You know what this yeah, is? Yeah, fun. Really is. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Now, guys, we're going to be adding in our our pasta. We have one more batch of pasta. Uh, we just, it's right on a table that didn't get moved. We just okay, so we're getting the pasta yeah, added. Right, exactly. Now comes the pasta. So the pasta will be added, and then after that, guys, to really finish it off, uh, the tada. We're going to be putting in bocconcini. Do you guys know what bocconcini no, is? No, what is bocconcini? Oh, you no, know, Chef, Tell I, me. Um, I got confused between that and the garlic roll that you gave me. I was going to stick that in the roller. Ah, okay. But that's okay if it happens, it, right? It, listen, mistakes happen. We learn, and that's the best part of all. So, guys, what we're going to try and do at this point is put the bocconcini in. Now, bocconcini, that's in this case, are little mozzarella balls. Yeah. You guys have a little sample. Ooh. Have a little sample. Have a little mm. sample. Definitely, thank you. To me, I have to have great music when I cook. I have a wonderful cheese that will be topping off our meal, and this is Parmigiano Reggiano. And even for the after school cooking classes I do, I don't believe in shaky cheese and the green cans. I believe in good stuff. And you know, when you have only you know, a small amount of ingredients, put in quality. quality. Do extra virgin olive oil. Okay. Do a good, you know, grate of cheese. You know, I'm using some organic pasta. Just make it something that will just boost the flavor and, all, and the nutrition, the nutrition too. I know. Oh, I just, the yeah. odor wafting over here. Yeah, that in there. Actually, yeah, there's a chance, right? This this side is much better, I think. We got it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Now I think we would give ourselves a little opportunity again in a, in a better world. This one would be resting for between one and four hours to build up the flavors. Okay. But this one, everybody, is ready to Yay, rock and roll. Let me have the ladle. And I want you guys to give me your honest honest opinion. Okay. Well, Chef, if this is as good as it smells, yes. I think you have we're two made, new students. Woo! Right Excellent! And I are gonna Score! Right down one down. A little extra Parmesan Reggiano, guys. I'll, oh, let you, I'll let you do a little right? bit of grating. Got to have a little extra cheese. Okay. Give, me, give me the, the clean one. Okay. I, I like the way it looks. I, I like it's, everything. Yeah, it's a, it's a party in the mouth. It's yeah, awesome. a party in the mouth. Sometimes wrapping the gift is more fun. Exactly. That's right. Right? I love yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. I have forks on either side of the table, guys, as well. Okay. We have forks over here. Okay. What do you think? And there you go, Peg. Okay. Perfect. To you. And if okay. you want some Parmesan or Reggiano kind of topping it off, we'll hand it down. Oh, nice. oh definitely. That's going to be delicious. Nice. This is your fork. Yeah, yeah. Gets a fork. Oh, thank you. Can yeah, we, exactly can we help ourselves cheese? to this? Please. This was magnificent. Totally. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Any more cheese for you guys? Yes. yes. Oh, baby, that Maybe look good. That looks so good. A, a little slice or two? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Peg, do you want some? Yeah, yes. of course. It's the good stuff. Oh, it smells so Thank good. You. All right. And I'm before passing this down. Eat, yeah. Yes, you want to say Please. something? Please. Can I say with someone on television here? Yes. Let's thank the good Lord for the yeah. good food. The best country in the world, the U.S. of A. Let's stay strong and free and make everybody else strong and free. That's Thank beautiful you. Thing. That's beautiful. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. So guys, let's see you eat. Shall we? Manja. And you can have a bowl too. Wait, did you get this? Did you get one to put in there? Pass that down as well, please. Now, each time I do a, a, ch a child's event or a party, guys, wow. I always say after the first bite, so guys, what do you think? Oh, it's delicious. So guys, what do you think? Salud. Salud. Awesome. Manja, everybody. Mm. Mm.
That's all it does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Want to say goodbye to everybody? Everyone who's helped out? Everybody, come on over and let's eat. Manja. Come on over and join us. Well played, everyone. Yeah. Hey.